the Lord be with you. Please, please remain seated. So we've heard the two uh, infancy stories and the birth stories of Jesus. Uh, from my reading today, I want to uh, read uh, a report of one of my first Christmases uh, on planet Earth. I wrote it actually about five or six years ago. I called it A Child's Christmas in Cork. The best stories of all are reimagined. Reimagining is when you cross remembering with imagining. It is the child who can turn ordinary events into exotic adventures, transforming drab black and white photos into colorful 3D holographic videos. It is the gift most prized by poets, seers, artists, and scientists to enable them to go where none had gone before them. It is the quest of the old spirit in a young body who is happy to shift through the dung heap to discover the pony hiding in its warm, moist, steamy embrace. It salvages the miraculous from the illusion of the mundane, prizing open the sand-camouflaged oyster shell to reveal the pearl of great price. It is the mystic releasing the eternal from the clutches of the mortal. And it is the charism I will use to recall my Christmas of 1950, when I had just turned four. I lived then not with my parents, but with my grandparents at number 34 St. Rita's Avenue in Gorona Broher. We locals just called it Gron. Together with four aunts and three uncles, one of whom, Uncle Noel, is two months younger than me. A regular visitor was my paternal great-grandmother, whom I loved dearly and whom I called Muddy. Given the state of communications back then, no computers, faxes, nor iPads, establishing contact with Santa Claus, or Santi, as he was known in Cork, was rather tricky. Even snail mail was costly. The postage to the North Pole was prohibitive for most of us, so Santi had devised a special arrangement for the children of Ireland. Here's how it went. Sometime during the last week before Christmas, after school was out, you tear a clean page out of your copy book and write, Dear Santi, my name is Sean. I live in number 34 St. Vitas Avenue in Gron, across the road from the O'Donnells. Please, can you bring me a gun and holster? My uncle Noel is writing to you as well. He wants a gun and holster too, but he's left-handed, so don't get the holsters mixed up. I, I love you, Sean. Then you'd put the sheet of paper, sans envelope, up the chimney, making sure that you didn't get burned by the ever-glowing turf fire. The hot air wafted it upwards and sped it towards the North Pole. You'd rush outside to watch its progress. Sometimes it would be snowing and you'd have a gaggle of street urchins like yourself standing on St. Rita's Avenue watching the snowflakes flow down and the Santa letters float up like speckled salmon fighting against the rapids on their journey home. They always made it. Words inspired by Santi. Vi faraon fodo, agus fodo de vi, agus sian tanam avir na midir. That's how all Irish stories begin. There was a man in it a long time ago, and it is a long time ago since he was in it, and the name that was on him was, and then you start your story. So there was a man in it a long time ago, and it is a long time ago since he was in it, and the name that was on him was Mither the Proud. And Mither was one of the fairy folk in Ireland. And the history of the fairy folk, in case you don't know it already, and way, way, way back, at one stage, there was two famous battles at a place called Moitura in Ireland between the current residents of Ireland who were known as the Tuhade Danan, or the people of the goddess Dana, and the new arrivals who were the Milesians, better known as the Celts. And the Celts defeated the Tuhade Danan in two great battles, and so they came to an agreement that they would divide the land of Ireland up between the two groups. But it wasn't that one group got the north and the other got the south, or one group got the west and the other got the east. Rather, the agreement was that the Celts would own all of Ireland above the ground, 
and the tour that Donnan would own all of Ireland beneath the ground. And so they shapeshifted and they became the fairy folk, but they lived long, long, long lifetimes, and they built these extraordinary cities and castles underground. And occasionally, they'd make appearances that we knew as the fairy folk or the good people. Now, Midder the Proud was one of these princes. He was a fairy prince. And at that stage, they toured that down and practiced uh, uh, polygamy. So our king could have many, many wives. So Midder was married to a woman called Fumnach. But at one stage he met and he fell in love with a woman called Etain, who was allegedly the most beautiful fairy princess in all of Ireland. And so he took her home to his castle. But uh, Fumnach was not impressed. She got really, really upset. And so she consulted a druid. And between them, they turned Etain into a butterfly. And then they created this extraordinary storm that blew her out of the window of the palace and driv- drove her all over fairyland for seven years, until finally she landed in the castle of Angus Og, who was the Tuatha Danann god of love. And he recognized her, even though she was in butterfly form, he recognized her as a fairy princess. So he gave her sanctuary, and she lived there for about seven years. But eventually, Fuamnach got to hear that she was still alive and being protected by Angus Og, so she created another almighty storm that blew her not only all over fairyland, but out through a portal into the land of mortals and humans. And so now this butterfly is being wafted about, and finally she lands in the castle of the King of Leinster, on top of a raft or something like this, during a big, big feast. And the king and the queen are sitting at the, ta- the table with the top no- nobles, and she lands this butterfly, and she's really, really, really tired. And finally, she just falls and lands inside the goblet of the queen. The queen is drinking mead, which is an ancient Irish drink, a mixture of honey and wine, and plops right into it, and the queen didn't notice. Now, the couple were infertile and had no children. They really, really wanted a child. So the queen drank this down, not knowing that there was a butterfly in it, And exactly nine months later, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl. And when they decided to name the child, somehow the mother insisted the child had to be called Etain, although there was nobody in their family called Etain. And so the fairy princess is now born as a human woman. And she grows up in the human world even more beautiful than she'd been in the fairy world. And everybody loved her. And finally, a match was made with her Uh, for her with the king of Ireland, the king of all Ireland, and they were deeply in love. Now, once every year, there was famous games, like the Olympic Games happened in Ireland. They were called the Talton Games, and they went on for a full week. All kinds of contests, including chess. The Irish were very, very good at chess in the ancient times. We called it Cliche Fihila. And so on the first day of the games, all of a sudden, this extraordinary rider comes on a white horse galloping towards the games. But for some reason, the only person that can see him is Etain. And he comes right up to her and he tells her, I am your husband, Mither the Proud from Fairyland. I want to take you back home with me. And she has no memory of it whatsoever, so she just fobs him off. So three days later, he comes back on this white charger, and this time he allows everybody to see him. And he comes right up to the King of Ireland and he says, I challenge you to a game of chess. And the king said, the king was a very good chess player. So they take out a chess board and they pay. They play. And the king of Ireland wins it. So Mither says, okay, um, what do you want? And he said, I want a bag full of silver. So Mither goes right down to his horse and pulls off his saddlebag and brings it back up and it's filled with silver coins. And Mither says, I challenge you to a second game. So they play the second game. And unfortunately, Mither loses the second game. So he says to the king, what do you want now? And the king says, I want a full bag of gold coins. So Mither goes back to his horse, pulls off the other saddlebag, and brings it back, and is full of gold coins. So Mither says, finally, okay, I want one last game. The king says, fine. So they play the last game, and Mither wins it. And the king of Ireland says, oh, well, what's your prize? What do you want? And Mither says, I want one kiss from your ten. And the king is really shocked. He says... He had to have granted, of course, but he says, I'll grant it, but not today. You've got to come back in one month's time, and I'll grant it. So in the meantime, he's waiting, the month is up, and he has all of his troops around the castle in concentric rings, and inside the big feast hall, 
his best warriors in a big, big circle and the ten inside in the middle of them. And all of a sudden, this extraordinary being arrives, mither, into the circle, and the king says, you get one kiss, and that's it. So he comes into the circle, and he bends down, and he plants his lips on Etienne's lips, and all of a sudden, the two of them elevate, and everybody is shocked, and out through a window, and they all rush outside. It's the middle of the night, and all they see is two white swans flying across the face of the moon. Now I tell you that story because it's going to lead into what I'm going to talk about in the homily. <laughs> Strangely enough. The conception of Eten in the Queen's womb was a miraculous event. There was no human agency involved in it. So I want to examine three questions this morning for the homily. I want to ask myself the question, how unique are the conception and the birth stories of Jesus? And secondly, how factual are the gospel accounts and the traditions we hear about the childhood of Jesus? And then thirdly, what is the real purpose of the Jesus event in our lives? So those are the three points I'll make this morning. So the first one, how unique is the, the Christ event, the Jesus event, his conception and his birth? The first thing I ever want to do, I'm sure everybody is the same, when you meet a newborn baby is to ask permission of the mother to take the child and to cuddle it. That's the first thing I like to do. And the second thing I like to do with a neonate is to, oh, to look straight into the child's eyes and to ask the question telepathically, what are you coming to do? What is your purpose? What is your mission on planet Earth? Because every single one of us has a unique mission. Whenever I meet a very, very a heroic figure, a hero or a heroine, whether it's in real life or whether it's in a historical personage, the first thing I want to do is I want to look at some attribute of that person that I could try to develop myself. And the second thing I want to do is to try to uh, figure out what was the childhood of that person like. And if there's no record of, of the childhood, I'll make it up. I'll invent a childhood for them. And I found out over the years that, you know, I didn't, I didn't do this just on my own. Everybody does it. All famous people have childhoods invented for them. So I'll give you a few examples. People want to, if they don't have any facts, they want to make up stories about what the childhood of a very famous person could have been like. And so the Buddha. There's a story that the Buddha was conceived miraculously after his mother had a vision in which her side was pierced by a white elephant. And nine months later, she gave birth to the Buddha. There's a story of Lao Tzu, the great Chinese sage, who was a contemporary of the Buddha's, slightly earlier, lived about 600 uh, BCE, that Lao Tzu spent 600 years in his mother's womb before he was born. Imagine the morning sickness of that. <laughs> There's a story about, in, from Persia, of the great prophet Zarathustra, sometimes known as Zoroaster, that his mother got pregnant by swimming in a lake in which a previous prophet 600 years before had deposited his seed and the mother was impregnated by the seed that had been there for 600 years, giving birth to Zarathustra. Mithra, the great Mithra, Mithraism was a great religion in early Rome that contended with Christianity. Mithra allegedly was born literally from a rock. You take Alexander the Great, who flourished about 300 BCE. Alexander, allegedly, was fathered by three different gods. One of his fathers was Marduk, who was the god of Babylon. A second of his fathers was Zeus, who was the, god, the chief god of the Greeks. And the third one was Amun-Ra, who was the god of the Egyptians. So, allegedly, Alexander the Great was fathered by three divinities. And when you examine, you know, all the great mythologies, the Nordic mythology, the Celtic mythology, Hinduism, again and again and again you have instances of divine beings mating often with human women and producing demigods. In fact, there's a very strange passage in chapter 6 of the book of Genesis where it says, The sons of God found the daughters of men to be very attractive, and so they took them to wife as many as they wanted her, and they gave, rise, they gave rise, rise to the great nation called the Nephilim. So the sons of God, whoever they were, divine beings, 
You know, at that stage, Judaism is not monotheistic. So these divine beings found human women very attractive, and they mated with them and created the demiurges or the demigods. So again and again and again, you get these stories. Now, there's a point to that, and I can get, I'll get to that at the very, very end. There's a point in what happens when the divine mixes with the human. Every one of you is a demiurge. Every one of you is a demigod. Every one of you is God stuff incarnated. But that's a story for another day, perhaps. So that's the first point I want to make, that uh, these stories of Jesus' conception and birth, they're not at all unique. It was very, very common in the ancient world that this is how special children were conceived and birthed. So that'd be the first point. So let's look at the stories then around the Jesus event itself. You know, how factual are these stories? So let me go through the four Gospels, the canonical Gospels first, beginning in the proper chronology, because although we learn them as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's not how they were written. Mark precedes Matthew by 10 years. So it was Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. So Mark wrote his gospel around the year 70 AD, which would be in about 40 years after Jesus had died. There was not a single mention of any childhood event of Jesus in Mark's gospel. Mark goes straight into the adult Jesus. There's no angels. There's no miraculous conception. There's no miraculous birth. There's no childhood stories whatsoever. He goes straight into it. And when you read through Mark's gospel, if all you had was Mark's account of Jesus, you'd think you were meeting in Jesus an extraordinary human being who died in despair. The very last thing Mark says of Jesus is Jesus hanging on the cross here and he says one thing, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? So you'd be faced with a Jesus who was an extraordinary human being, but very fallible who died in despair. Ten years later, Matthew comes along, and Matthew changes it completely. Matthew now has a whole bunch of very important childhood stories. So he starts off with this long, long, long genealogy of 42 generations, starting with Abraham right down to Jesus. And he divides it into three sections of 14 generations. 14 generations from Abraham to King David. So Abraham lived about 1850 BCE. David lived about 1000 BCE. So the first 14 generations are from 1850 to 1000. The next 14 generations from the birth from, from David down to the Babylonian captivity when the last two tribes of Israel are taken into exile in Babylon. And that happened in 587 BCE. And then the third group is from the Babylonian captivity to the birth of Jesus, which happened about 6 BCE, not at zero, about 6 BCE. And so what Matthew is trying to establish that Jesus is the new Moses. He is the Messiah long awaited by Judaism. So he's at pains to create a gospel which shows Jesus to be the new Moses. Uh, Moses gave man in the desert, Jesus will bring the Eucharist in the desert. Uh, he actually divides, Matthew divides his book into five segments, like the Pentateuch, the five books ascribed to Moses. So he will invent stories of uh, an angel coming to Mary, Gabriel, announcing that you are to be the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. There will be wise men come from the east in Matthew's account, bearing gifts of frankincense and gold and myrrh. And then there will be the story that Herod tried to kill the child and destroyed all male infants under age two in Bethlehem and his vicinity. Now, why is this story? Uh, there is no historical evidence whatsoever that that happened. Although, in fact, Herod was totally paranoid about being overthrown. He killed his favorite wife. He killed his mother-in-law. I know a lot of guys would like to kill their mother-in-laws. <laughs> And then he killed two of his own sons. He was so paranoid about being overthrown. But there is no event, whatsoever, no uh, historicity whatsoever that he killed all the male infants in Bethlehem. So why is this story there? Because um, Matthew has to make Jesus the new Moses. And just like the Pharaoh had tried to destroy all the Hebrew children in Egypt, now uh, Herod has to destroy the male children in Bethlehem. So he's trying to prove that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. So the birth stories that he makes up are to shore this up. Ten years later comes Luke's account of Jesus. And Luke is the only non-Jew to write any part of the Judeo-Christian scriptures. He was a, a physician, a, a Roman citizen, Greek-speaking physician. And Luke wrote his book in two parts. The first part is called the Gospel of Luke, and the second part is called the Acts of the Apostles. There are two parts of the one book, actually. And they're both dedicated to a man called Theophilus. Now, Theophilus in Greek just simply means God lover. So either Luke was trying to address this 
to a real Roman governor whose name was Theophilus, or he was addressing it to anybody who was a God lover, anybody who was interested in being a God lover. And Luke has one purpose. He's trying to uh, show that the Jesus movement is no threat to Rome. So he's painting a very different kind of Jesus. And he's going to point out a Jesus who's not just a Jewish Messiah, but actually is a world saviour. So instead of doing a genealogy of Jesus that began with Abraham, he goes right back to Adam. So he's showing that Jesus, descended of Adam, is a saviour for all humankind. So that's what he'll emphasise. And again, Luke will have stories of an angel announcing the, uh, Mary's conception of Jesus. And he'll have shepherds, as were pointed out, who will come in to see the, the baby Jesus. And the angel, the choir of angels will accompany it. And he'll have a story where he has to bring the couple, Mary and Joseph, from Nazareth, where they're living, down to Bethlehem, where Jesus is going to be born. So he invents a story about a census you know, that was called by Caesar Augustus. Now, there is no evidence for that census. There are censuses in other years, but they're totally, they do not match this date whatsoever. But he has to try to get the, the, the family down to Bethlehem, because originally Joseph's family were from Bethlehem. So he has this story where Caesar Augustus has everybody go to their home place, to their original place, in order to be registered, and they have to go down there. So as well as that, then, you have so Luke's whole thesis is that Jesus is a world saviour, not just a narrowly Jewish Messiah. By the time he gets to John, the Gospel of John written 100 AD, John has no mention whatsoever of the conception of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, the childhood of Jesus. He starts straight off with his adult. But he prefaces his Gospel with one of the most extraordinary writings in Scripture, the prologue, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So for John, not only is Jesus not just a kind of uh, an extraordinary human being who died in despair, not only is he uh, a saviour for Judaism, not only is he a world saviour, he's a cosmic Christ. He was before there was time. So John has a totally different account. You move forward now to some of the non-canonical Gospels. And there's one of them called the Infancy Gospel of James. It was written in the second century. And it was immediately condemned by the church fathers as being absolutely blasphemous and heretical. And I'm inclined to agree with them. So there's a whole bunch of stories there about Jesus as a little infant and Jesus as a little boy. Now, one of them is very nice. There's a story that, as a small child, Jesus loved to make clay birds. He'd take clay, fashion them into birds, and then breathe on them, and they'd fly off. And you actually find this story about Jesus in the Koran, in the Holy Koran. But it gets worse from there on. At age one, Jesus, the baby, kills another child. Slightly afterwards, he kills a second child, and there are three different accounts in the Gospel as to why he killed the second child. One says that this child bumped into him. Another one says that this child cursed him. And a third one says that this child threw stones at him. But whatever his, he did, Jesus cursed him, and the child withered and died away. And finally, the neighbors have enough of this, and they come to Mary and Joseph, and they complain about the antics of their child. And Jesus' response is to curse the neighbors, and they all go blind. Now, this is a sociopath, yeah? But uh, these are some of the stories about Jesus, you know, that made it into other Gospels. And then there was the Gospel according to Muddy, my great-grandmother, who told me stories I never saw in any of the Gospels. And one of my favorite ones was, she had this story that when the Holy Family were escaping because Herod was trying to kill the child, they're in the desert riding on their donkey as fast as they can, heading for Egypt, and Herod's soldiers are often thundering in their kind of war charges after them. And so Joseph sees a cave, and he decides they'll hide in the cave and see if they can you know, remain undetected. And as they're going into the cave, there's a bird sitting outside called the wren. Now in Ireland we call it the wren because of our accents. And the wren saw where they were hiding, and as the soldiers were coming along, the, the wren started saying, they're in the cave, they're in the cave, they're in the cave. So the soldiers went to search the cave. In the meantime, all the spiders in the cave got together, and they created this huge, thick web over the entrance. So when the soldiers came to go, the lady said, are you joking me? No, nobody has been in here for years and years and years. So they turned and went away, and the holy family was saved. And therefore, you should never kill a spider my great-grandmother said, but if you meet a ran, kill the ran. <laughs> and actually, there was a practice in Ireland. On the day after Christmas, every single year, in Ireland it was known as uh, it's St. Stephen's Day, the feast day. It was known in Ireland as the ran day, 
Ran meaning Ren. And all little boys would dress up in costumes and go around annoying people at six o'clock in the morning, banging on the door, singing songs and demanding money to shut up. <laughs> and the song went like this. The ran, the ran, the king of all birds since Stephen's day. Got caught in the furs, up with the kettle and down with the pot. Give us our answer and let us be off. Knock at the knocker, ring at the bell. Please give us a copper for singing so well. Singing so well, singing so well. Please give us a copper for singing so well. So the ran learned his lesson. So there were the stories that, that grew up around it. You know, how much factual, how much not. You take some of the church stories, like, for instance, the notion that Jesus was born on December 25th. Where did that come from? Actually, for the first three centuries of Christianity, they did not celebrate Jesus' birth at all. It was not an issue. They talked about the, real, the living Jesus, the preaching and the miracles of Jesus. There was no celebration of his birth whatsoever for the first three centuries. The first one to be thinking about it was a guy called Clement of Alexandria in the third century. And he played around with possible dates, and he came up with seven different dates when Jesus might have been born. And none of them was December 25th. The idea that Jesus was born on December 25th only arrived in the fourth century. So that's, you know, that's a story that was made up at some stage as well. Then there's the story, which is a mistranslation of Luke's gospel. The notion that uh, there was no room for them at the, in the inn, so the child had to be born in a stable. Now, it hinges on a particular Greek word. The Greek word that Luke is using is the word kataluma. And kataluma is mistranslated in English very often as an inn, as like a hotel, the Sheraton or someplace. So Jesus and Mary and the donkey are going to want to go to the Sheraton, you know, to, for the Christmas. And they're, they're all full. So they have to go outside the town and they find a stable. The problem with the story is that in the Palestinian households of the time of Jesus, Every house had a kind of a guest quarter because family was very important. When family from out of town came visiting, you wanted to be able to accommodate them. So there was a place called the Cataluma, which was dedicated to the visitors when they arrived. It's not that it couldn't be used otherwise, but if visitors arrived, they had pride of place here. And also in the households, there was like a kind of a basement section where the animals slept. And there was two reasons for that. Firstly, the animals always came in at night because they could be protected like that. And secondly, they acted as a heating system. They gave off so much heat that they heated the whole house. And the same thing was true in the Africa in which I lived for 14 years. The animals slept inside in the house uh, with, with people. So they gave off this gr gr grind hot air and they protected the animals. And so what happened very probably was if Mary and Joseph had to go all the way from Nazareth down to Bethlehem to get registered for the census, they would go to a family, to an um, extended family. And they'd come to their relatives, to only to find that other relatives from other parts had beaten them to it, and the guest room was absolutely full of a whole bunch of people. And Mary is about to give birth, so they try to want to accommodate her and give her kind of space and privacy, so they bring her down to where the animals are. There won't be any other human beings there. And very often, there are indentations in the floor filled with straw that the animals are going to be eating out. So it's very possible that out of respect for privacy and confidentiality, that is where they brought Joseph and Mary, and that is where the child was born. Or you take the notion of uh, the three wise men. The notion is that there were three kings, and we even give them names from the East. The word that's used in Greek is magoi, and magoi doesn't mean a king, it means a wise one or a wise man. And they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, so we created the fact that there were three of them. We call them three kings. We have no idea how many there were. We know it was just plural. It could have been two or it could have been ten. There were three gifts, but there could have been any number of these, and there weren't kings, there were simply wise men. And then you have the notion of the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree actually is an old, old, old pagan uh, feast. The first time it was ever used in a Christian household was in 1576 in Germany. A German household created the tree, a uh, Christmas tree, 1576, and we borrowed it. So these are kind of the... Uh, these are the kind of the facts of the case. These are the stories that grew up around the child Jesus. And now I come to the heart of the matter. The third point. What is the real meaning of the Christ event? And I believe that the real meaning of the Christ event is that Jesus is the archetype par excellence of the trajectory of every single soul from inception to enlightenment. I do not believe that life starts at birth and ends at death. 
I don't even believe that life starts at conception and ends at death. Life starts when God spins off a fractal of herself, what we call a soul. And it only ends when that soul, through many, many, many incarnations, has realized that it is God's stuff and begins to identify the God stuff in self and others and then re-merges back with source. That's the whole trajectory. That is the archetype of the Jesus event. The realization that we've all been spun off as fractals of God and that through countless incarnations we learn to remember that fact and to recognize that fact in each other and then finally merge with God again. But this archetype has two facets. It has a feminine facet and it has a masculine facet. And the feminine facet I've called in the past Christa consciousness. And that's represented par excellence by Mary, the mother of Jesus. And what are the attributes of the feminine aspect of Christa consciousness? It is uh, the ability to believe, to receive, and to conceive. The openness and the trust in the process. To allow the word of God to take place in the heart first, in the body, in the womb, and then to carry it, to birth it, and to give it back to the world. That's the feminine face of God. That's the archetype, the feminine face of the archetype. And the masculine face of the archetype is the Christ consciousness. It is the one then who can go out as a warrior into the world, but not a warrior uh, with swords and spears, rather a warrior of the word. The warrior who goes out with the attributes of courage and compassion, the ability to confront a world of darkness, a world which is lost in institutional dogma, and to confront it with the reality. So it is courage and it is compassion. It is the head and the heart united. It's the ability to challenge the older systems. It's Christ's uh, self-appointed mission to be the bearer of good news and healing. The good news is the intellectual brilliance of this man to be able to see his times and to offer to us a model of reality that far exceeded what was current or what is even current in our day and age. And the heart to go along with it by healing his healing ministry. So this for me is what uh, the mystery of Christmas is about. This is the archetype. It is the re remembrance, the second message of Christmas for me is the realization that every conception and every birth is miraculous. Whether it's a baby lion being born in the Serengeti in East Africa, you know, or a Buddha being born in a palace in India. Every conception and every birth is absolutely miraculous. That's what Christmas is meant to remind us of. And thirdly, it's important that Jesus did not come to be worshipped. Jesus came as an exemplar of what it looks like when you become so self-realized that you recognize the divinity in yourself and you recognize the divinity in everybody else. But of course, churches, institutions constantly turn these great mystical possibilities in into, into institutional dogma. So if you were raised Christian, you would have been led to believe that this event only happened once, that only once throughout all of human history did the word of God become flesh. I say that the word of God becomes flesh in every bunny rabbit, in every flower, in every mountain, in every stream, in every human being. Everything that exists is a word of God made flesh. And Meister Acker said it very, very powerfully. The human mission then is this. In a great Christmas homily he gave about 600 years ago, he said, of what use to me is it that my Savior was born of a virgin 1400 years ago? If he's not born again in my time and in my heart, Every single one of us is meant to be the mother of God. And that indeed is the human vocation. Every single one of us is meant to be the mother of God. So today, maybe more than any other time in human history, God desperately needs to be born into our world. Have you got a womb to rent? So normally at this stage, I would open it up to question and answer discussions. I want to do something different today. I want to build on the great story of Charles Dickens, where Scrooge has these three visions, the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the ghost of Christmas future. And I want to try and lead us through um, an act of imagination, a guided imagery, where I'm going to invite you to go back into one Christmas of your past, to look at the first Christmas as you understand it, how Jesus was actually born 
and to look at a future Christmas for yourself, for your family, or for your world. So I'm going to lead us in a, in a guided visualization for a while. So I invite you to, to close your eyes. And I want you to breathe in really deeply, right down into your belly. And I want to remind you again that the breath is the interface between spirit and matter. In many languages, one single word means breath, life, spirit. In English, the word inspiration, to take spirit in, to be alive, to be creative. In Greek, it's pneuma. In Swahili, it's pepo. In Sanskrit, it's prana. So your breath is the connection between your source and yourself. So as you're breathing in, I want you to let this oxygenated air flow into every part of you, relaxing and healing every single part of you. So with the first breath, I invite you to imagine this healing, oxygenated blood flowing right down to the soles of your feet and your heels and ankles and insteps. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any discomfort or pain in that part of your body and relax. And with your next breath, I invite you to watch this healing liquid visit your calves and your shins and your knees. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any discomfort or pain in that part of your body and relax a little more deeply. And with the next breath, you imagine this healing, oxygenated blood flowing into your quadriceps and buttocks. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any discomfort or pain in that part of your body and relax. And with the next breath, you see this oxygenated blood coursing through your entire torso, your abdomen, your chest, all of your internal organs, your lungs, your liver, your kidneys, your heart. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any discomfort or pain or anxiety in that part of your body and relax a little more deeply. And with your next breath, you feel this healing liquid coursing through your shoulders, into your biceps and triceps, through your elbows, into your forearms and wrists, down into the palms of your hands, right down to your fingertips. And every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any anxiety or tension or discomfort in that part of your body and relax a little more deeply. And finally, with the next breath, you feel this healing energy moving up through your throat and neck, up into your chin and jaw, into your mouth and nostrils, into your eyes and ears, along the sides of your head and the back of your head and the front of your head, right up to the crown of your head, touching all of the internal parts of you, your intellect, your imagination, your memories, your willpower, and every place it touches, it brings healing and it brings peace. And every time you breathe out now, you can let go of any anxiety or tension or fear and relax completely. And in that relaxed state, I'm going to take you on a little journey I want you to imagine that it's nighttime with a full moon and you're alone on a beach, a beautiful golden beach. And you're lying on your back, 
listening to the sounds of the waves. And you become aware of your physical body. And I want you to become aware of your legs, firstly. And as you become aware of them, you get the in experience of the legs actually getting longer and longer as they're pushing further and further from your torso, still connected, but you can hear the sound of your heels pushing through the sand. And you feel it like sandpaper under your calves as your legs elongate longer and longer. And now there's a symphony created by the sound of the sand and the sound of the waves. And then it stops and your legs and feet begin to retract to their original length and position. And now you become aware of the same phenomenon in your hands. Your hands are spread out your sides with the palms down. You feel the sand under your palms. And once more you feel as if these are being elongated, moving further and further, still connected to your shoulders, but extending, extending, extending. And you feel the sand even get under your fingernails, getting longer and longer. And then it stops and you begin to retract them. And they go back to their original length and position. And now you have the same sensation in your head and neck. It's as if your neck is elongating, pushing your head further and further from your torso along the beach. And you hear the crunch of the sand in your hair. And you hear the waves lapping. And then it stops. And it comes back to its original position. And now your entire body is taken over by this sensation and you feel as if you're expanding in all directions simultaneously. And it's a wondrous feeling of liberation. And you realize that the entire organism is dissolving into the molecules of the matter of which it's composed, taking up more and more physical space on the beach. And then finally even the molecules are disassembling into the atomic structure and you're occupying more and more space. And then finally, you become aware of the subatomic particles until finally, all that you're aware of are the trillions of photons of light of which you are composed. You are star stuff. And your sense of self is very different. It's a cosmic sense of self. You stand outside of time and outside of space and you flood off and now you are the master both of time and space. And I invite you to revisit some place on planet Earth and some time in your personal history, some Christmas of the past. And for the next three minutes, I'm going to remain completely silent. And I want you to visit that Christmas and mine it, harvest it for its message.
And now I invite you to gather up the message of that Christmas. And I want you to take your sense of self, this expanded cosmic sense of self. And I want you to spin the globe. And I want you to land where and when you think the Saviour was born. To experience that, to harvest it, and to bring back a message for yourself. And once again, I'm going to remain completely silent for the next three minutes as you do that. And once more, I invite you to gather your sense of self, your cosmic sense of self, to leave that time and to project yourself into a future time, into a future Christmas, and to focus on you, your mission, your family, and your world, and to honor it and bless it with your intentionality. And once more, I I wait for three minutes to allow you to do that.
And now I invite you to bring back your attention to this cosmic sense of self. And I want you to take the photons of this light body of yours and to repackage them into the molecules of your physical body and to begin bringing your attention and your awareness back into this time and this space. And when it feels good to you, I invite you just to open your eyes. Namaste, my brothers and sisters, and happy Christmas. <laughs>